everybody. Thank you for tuning in to episode 108 of The Virtual Couch. I'm your host, Tony Overbay. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified mindful habit coach, writer, speaker, husband, father of four, ultra marathon runner, and creator of The Path Back, an online pornography addiction recovery program that is helping people reclaim their lives from pornography addiction. If you or anyone that you know is struggling with pornography addiction, please point them to pathbackrecovery.com. There you can download a short ebook that describes five common mistakes that people make when trying to overcome pornography addiction. Okay, again, home stretch for coupon code Happy New Year, all one word. That will give you $50 off the cost of the Path Back Recovery Program. And follow me on Instagram at Virtual Couch, Facebook, Tony Overbay, Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist. Uh, go to TonyOverbay.com, sign up there to get more info on upcoming exciting news. And uh, just a lot, of, uh, a lot of episodes coming up here. I've got uh, quite a few that I have been guests on other podcasts, and I want to put those out as bonus episodes. So I'm going to try to have a, a bunch of bonus episodes coming up later on in the week. So trying to get maybe two out a week. And uh, today alone, i um, recording this podcast today, and uh, I'm going to be on Natalie Hansen's Babes Unpaused podcast, which is a, a lot of fun, and uh, Emily Gaudreau's How to Raise a Maverick a little bit later on today, too. So I'm not sure when those are going to come out, but uh, really, really honored that these are some people that have reached out and asked me to guest on their podcast. And speaking of guests on a podcast, I wanted to give a little bit of the behind the scenes, how things work on the interview I released last Friday. It was with a guy, a gentleman named John Kim. He's AKA also known as the angry therapist. And I just thought this was kind of fun. I always enjoy when I listen to podcasts and people kind of talk a little bit about um, just, I don't know, the way things kind of shake out, line up. And that was one of the first times that I had been part of this like a book tour rollout. So I had been contacted by John's publicist. And uh, and I have I was very aware of him. He's a therapist and kind of has quite a following as the angry therapist and has a, um, a blog and a podcast as well. And I was uh, I was contacted by them. And they it's one of those funny things where they say, hey, he wants to be on your show. And I was flattered. I was honored and uh, just thought, oh, maybe he listens to my podcast because, again, I was familiar with her his. But I didn't realize what a big deal he was. And so it was kind of funny. I had him on my show and it was only about 20 minutes. You have a little window of opportunity and it's like you have to be ready. And all of a sudden and there he is. And he couldn't have been nicer. And I really loved the the content that he provided. And, uh, you know, for the kind of this angry therapist kind of a vibe, he was so nice and, and kind of just, uh, I don't know, well thought out and put together all that sort of stuff on, on the show. Um, again, this episode was out last Friday. And uh, so then I, I can't lie, I went and looked up uh, on his blog. He had posted a few things and I thought, oh, I wonder if he'll mention that he, he had a good time on the show or whatever. And I, and I go to his website and he's got a picture of him on the back of Dak Shepard, literally Dak Shepard giving him a piggyback ride. And uh, Dak Shepard and Kristen Bell have a podcast, which I'm sure is getting millions and millions of downloads per episode. And he just talked about what a wonderful experience it was to be on their podcast. So all of a sudden I felt like the virtual couch probably wasn't the biggest podcast of his day and that day where he had a bunch of podcasts lined up and that sort of thing. But still, I was just grateful that, uh, that you know, the virtual couch is getting noticed and having a publicist reach out. And I've had more and more of those, which is just a lot of fun. It really is because I just love trying to give um, listeners uh, just more and more um, just some data, some things to, to learn about human behavior or parenting. And uh, John Kim in particular talks a lot about manhood. And even though he's got this name, the angry therapist, it was a whole lot of stuff. If you listen to that one, and again, it's really short, but it was a lot of things about men being vulnerable, men being authentic, men finding hobbies, um, pursuing uh, even purpose over passion. I thought that was a really interesting part of the interview. So highly uh, recommend that if you haven't listened to that episode. Today, though, I wanted to do an episode on an article that was making the rounds last week. And remember the last week, last week was the week of Valentine's Day. And this study that was going around was titled, it was out of the University of Baylor. And you might have, you might have seen some reference to it, but uh, it was, it said couples creating art or playing board games released the love hormone, but men who paint most or men who paint released most. So again, couples creating art or playing board games release a love hormone. So, so let's talk a little bit about what exactly is the love hormone. It is, in fact, called oxytocin. So according to a Medical Newsday Today article, in 2012, researchers reported that people in the first stages of romantic attachment had higher levels of oxytocin compared with non-attached single people. And these levels then persisted for at least six months. 
And so, and, and sexual activity has actually been found to stimulate the release of oxytocin, but there's so much more to this love hormone. So let's kind of take a look at oxytocin in general. And I want to get back to that article because there's some pretty fascinating things in there that I think can hopefully help your relationship with your partner. So, so what actually is oxytocin? And some of the, the, maybe the women listening or hopefully very well tuned in guys know that oxytocin is something that you may have heard of during childbirth. Um, it's also important um, in breastfeeding. So oxytocin is a neurotransmitter and a hormone that's produced in the hypothalamus, the part of the brain. And then from there, it's transported to and it's secreted by the pituitary gland, which is at the, at the base of the brain. And I have to, a quick side note, I cannot talk about the pituitary gland without noting that uh, when I was a Guinness Book of World Records fan as a kid, this was well before the internet, and there was the world's tallest man, I think his name was Robert Waldlow, Waldo, Wadlow, eight foot 11, I think when he passed away, but that he had a something that had stimulated his pituitary gland. So he had just continually produced growth hormone. And I remember reading about someone else, some other very tall person, and they had had a, a tumor or a tumor on their pituitary gland, which then stimulated growth, the growth hormone. And I am not a very tall man, uh, the true confession. So there was always this uh, thought that I used to have of, you know, I don't know, what if I bumped my head just right and it stimulated the pituitary gland? And, you know, I just, I always became fascinated with this pituitary gland. So, uh, but, but now we're talking about the pituitary gland secretes this oxytocin at the base of the brain. Um, so it, uh, it secretes the hormone throughout the brain. So oxytocin plays a role in the female reproductive functions, kind of as we mentioned, from sexual activity to childbirth and breastfeeding. During labor, oxytocin increases uterine motility. So it causes contractions in the muscles of the uterus and the womb. And uh, so then as the cervix and uh, the vagina start to widen for labor, oxytocin is released. And then this widening increases further contractions. So I'm only pointing this out to say, how do we get back to this whole part about painting and board games, talking about oxytocin? Um, um, so oxytocin also has social functions. It impacts bonding behavior and the creation of group memory, social recognition, all kinds of other social functions. Oxytocin is also used as a prescription drug under the brand name Pitocin. And a, an oxytocin injection or this injection of Pitocin is sometimes used to start birth contractions or strengthen, strengthen in them during labor. But let's talk about oxytocin and emotion. So when oxytocin enters the bloodstream, um, yes, it affects the uterus and lactation, but when it's released into certain parts of the brain, it can impact emotional and cognitive and social behaviors. So one review of research into oxytocin says that the hormones impact on pro-social behaviors and emotional responses contributes to relaxation, trust, and psychological stability. Um, brain oxytocin also appears to reduce stress responses, including anxiety, and these effects have been seen in a number of species. So the hormone has been described as a, quote, important component of a complex neurochemical system that allows the body to adapt to highly emotive situations. So right now, oxytocin is just sounding like this miracle drug, right? Um, but is it that simple? In 2006, investigators reported finding, and this work gets a little bit tricky, higher levels of oxytocin and cortisol. Now, cortisol is a stress hormone among women who had gaps in their social relationships and more negative relations with their primary partner. The participants were all receiving hormone therapy following menopause. So kind of a lot in that sentence right there, or that paragraph. Um, animal studies have found high levels of both stress, so this cortisol, and oxytocin in voles. So uh, there's your, your vole studies for you um, that were separated from other voles. How sad. So when uh, voles were separated from other voles, they found high levels of, again, both the stress hormone cortisol and oxytocin. However, when voles were then given extra doses of oxytocin, their levels of anxiety, cardiac stress, and depression fell. Um, man, I always want to just, you know, th there's a thing called a Beck's depression index, which sometimes you give as a therapist. And I'm just trying to figure out what the vole version of that depression index is. But uh, they could tell that the depression fell in these voles when they gave them doses of oxytocin, suggesting that stress increases internal production of oxytocin, while externally supplied, do su supplied doses can help reduce stress. So it's kind of, the, I guess, the big question, and well, it says even here, clearly the action of oxytocin is not straightforward. So stress can produce both the stress hormone cortisol, and it can also pump up the oxytocin. So there's some even theories there that's kind of the, the, the curiosity around does it produce this oxytocin with the stress, kind of saying, hey, if you're feeling stressed, you also need this um, bonding hormone kind of just to say, 
Maybe I need somebody when I'm feeling stressed. I think that's kind of fascinating. A review published in 2013 cautions that oxytocin is likely to have a general rather than specific effects and that oxytocin alone is unlikely to affect complex higher order mental processes that are specific to social cognition. The authors also point out that a willingness to collaborate is likely to be driven by anxiety in the first place. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. So it's saying that when somebody does feel anxious, that their go-to might be then a willingness to collaborate. Even though at times when people feel anxious, they want to withdraw socially, it might be the brain pumping out this oxytocin that's saying, hey, um, I know you're feeling overwhelmed, but it might be a good time to reach out to somebody. And all we can do is throw you a little bit of oxytocin so that you can um, kind of, you know, kind of try to find somebody that you can bond with in this moment. So nevertheless, oxytocin does appear to be associated with social behavior, including maternal care, bonding between couples, sexual behavior, social memory, trust, that sort of thing. So back to the study out of, out of Baylor. So according to the researchers from Baylor, this study has implications for the everyday family. It's saying that it's important to find those small, meaningful ways to interact. So my podcast on shared experiences a few weeks ago, where I gave some research that said, that you know, talking about a movie basically between friends, or not even necessarily close friends per se, carried more weight than an individual driving their Ferrari, in essence, to the base of Mount Kilimanjaro, and then climbing it by themselves. So again, we want these shared experiences. So it's starting to look like this uh, this oxytocin, this, this love hormone. And there's some other research I found where they call it the hugging hormone. But uh, whatever the type of hormone is, it's almost saying that the brain is producing this thing because it wants us to go find somebody to hug wants us to find somebody that we can bond with even when we're feeling stressed. So let me go to the, the press release on the, the study. It says, when couples play board games together or take a painting class with each other, their bodies release oxytocin, sometimes dubbed as the, quote, hugging hormone. But men wielding paintbrushes release twice as much or more as the level of women painters and couples playing board games, the Baylor University study found. Uh, quote, we were expecting the opposite. The couples playing the board games would interact more because they were communicating about the games and strategies or because they were competing and with more interaction, they would release more oxytocin, which is associated with bonding and family cohesiveness, says Karen Melton, PhD, Assistant Professor of Child and Family Studies in this, uh, this research. The study, which is called Examining Couples, Recreation, and Oxytocin via the Ecology of Family Experiences Framework, is published in the Journal of Marriage and Family. Uh, and also the Journal of the National Council on Family Relations. So researchers also expected that painting couples would be more attentive to the instructor and to the canvas than to, the, than to their partners. But instead, couples in the art class reported more partner touching than couples playing board games. So I thought that was interesting. So while people are painting, the researchers anticipated that they would pay, the people painting would pay more attention to canvas and instructor, but instead um, they were interacting. Couples were interacting more. Uh, Melton... Um, this uh, Karen Melton, PhD, said, typically an art class is not seen as an interactive date with your partner, but sometimes couples that were painting turned the activity into a bonding time by choosing to interact, putting an arm around their partner or simply saying good job, according to Melton. The study is the first to examine how distinct types of leisure are associated with oxytocin release. Our big finding was that all couples release oxytocin when playing together, and that's good news for couples' relationships, Melton said. But men in the art class release two to two and a half times more oxytocin than the other groups. This suggests that some types of activities may be more beneficial to males than females and vice versa. So just right there alone, I am not an artist, not a painter, so I can't imagine um, putting off more oxytocin if I'm trying to paint, especially in front of my wife, who I think would, uh, very clever-witted um, my wife is, and would uh, probably do a, a marvelous job of making fun of the things that I paint. But I do feel like maybe there's something around there of being vulnerable, I guess, and, uh, and that that is something that then would increase or release more oxytocin. But researchers also identified a significant environmental impact and that couples in a novel setting and activity released more oxytocin than in a familiar home-like environment. That suggests that novelty can be an important factor to consider when planning date nights with our partners. So uh, translation, kind of what that's saying is that get out and do something different. You know, so when it talks about novelty releases more oxytocin than just being at home as well. So I don't know if that played into the part where if the, they're out in an art class, if they feel like that's more of a unique situation and, and thus here comes more oxytocin being um, 
produced by the brain. So from the study again, uh, Melton and a, another researcher's PhD, Maria Boccia, professor of child and family studies, recruited 20 couples ranging in age from 20 to 45, 25 to 40, sorry. Couples were randomly assigned to participate in one of two couple dates, game night or couples art class for one hour. One group played board games in a familiar home-like setting, so that might play into that whole novelty aspect, right? Couples were alone. These couples chose familiar games that would not require them to read instructions. <laughs> it's just kind of a joke there, right? I don't know if you ever tried to, um, whoever is going to read the instructions on a new game in the home, um, I feel like that can be a positive experience. Oftentimes, maybe not. But among the games were cards, checkers, chess, puzzles, dominoes, monopoly, and word games. Meanwhile, the other group participated in painting classes for couples at a community art studio. These couples participated in two groups of five couples. They painted a simple beach scene with their initials in the sand. So that, that got me a little more interested. I think I could maybe do a little bit of a beach scene. It wouldn't be very impressive. The art instructor had prepared the canvases to reduce interactions between the couples. To measure participants' oxytocin levels, um, researchers took urine samples before and after the activities, always making for a very, very smooth uh, couple's night, I'm sure, the before and after urine sample. They also administered a six-item survey about the couple's familiarity with the activities and about their communication, touch, and eye contact with their partners during the sessions, which lasted for about an hour. In the future, Melton and Boccia want to explore further what role the environment may, may play in oxytocin release. The researchers also noted that their study differs from others in which participants have been asked to perform specific actions, like cuddling, hand-holding, or massage, sometimes for an assigned period. The physical interactions in Melton and Boccia's study took place without prompting and lasted briefly. So I do think that's kind of significant. So they're talking about just more of a natural environment where people may um, put their arm around each other or touch a shoulder or an arm, which if you're uh, an attachment theory person, and uh, especially the work that I, I love talking about in emotionally focused therapy, there's some pretty neat studies there that just show that somebody going in to get a shot, for example, if they get a shot um, and their partner is near them or with them, their cortisol levels are less than had they been alone. But if their partner touches their arm or shoulder, then those stress that stress hormone oxytocin is even lower. An oxytocin, sorry, cortisol. The cortisol levels are even lower. So just even that physical touch from a partner can uh, can lower um, cortisol, can lower the stress hormone. So again, it's talking about this study, it says this has implications for the everyday family to find those small, meaningful ways to interact when they're eating dinner together or going for a walk or doing homework with a child or sitting on their couches with their iPads, Melton said. So while yes, this advice is simple, we also have to make sure that we're doing the hard work, they said. This is the hard advice. We have to make time for our families if we want to have families. So very, very interesting study, and, uh, and I love that. So it isn't just saying, I like that part at the end, that it's more of we need to find those small, meaningful ways to interact when we're eating, whether at dinner together, going on a walk, doing homework with our kids. Um, of course, it's talking about that it's it's great to have these novel experiences, but really this interaction, the couple's interaction, maybe a little bit more uh, playful banter, maybe a little bit more, um, you know, touching an arm, holding hands, that sort of thing is going to reduce, not reduce, release this oxytocin, the cuddle hormone. So before I let you go, um, I, and just the digging, I also found one other, I thought this was pretty interesting. I'll try to go through this one fast. But I found a Scientific American article that talked about a study published back in 2012. I think it was in Biological Psychiatry was the name of the, the, the um, magazine, journal, where this was published. But it was the first to assess whether people with variations in their oxytocin receptor genes have a harder time maintaining romantic relationships than those who don't. So here's where they were actually looking at the oxytocin receptors in the brain. So uh, someone named, uh, I think it's Hase Wallum, a graduate student at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, and his colleagues took advantage of Swedish twin studies that included thousands of participants, their genetic information, and their answers to questions about how affectionate they were with their romantic partners. And they found that women with a specific variation weren't as close to their partners as women without it, um, a specific variation of this oxytocin receptor. So uh, this said that they found that, okay, the, the women that had a specific variation of this oxytocin neuroreceptor, that they kissed their partners less and they didn't desire physical proximity as often. These women were also more likely to report having had a marital crisis. So although researchers don't know exactly how this variation affects the oxytocin system and may result in a lower number of oxytocin receptors in the brain, people with fewer receptors would be less sensitive to the hormone oxytocin's effects. So in uh, this time, this was back in 2012 or 13 when this article came out, it said in a study that hasn't been published yet, so I'm hoping that it's probably been published um, years ago, 
Uh, Feldman found that the oxytocin receptor genes are also linked to empathy in couples. So she looked at variants in the gene that have been linked with an increased risk for autism, uh, which they say at this time a disorder that's marked by major social communication deficits. She found that the more these risk variants a person had, the less empathy they showed toward their partner when that partner shared a distressing experience. Um, They went on to say oxytocin has been shown to help people with autism improve their ability to recognize emotion. And Wallen found that the same receptor variant that increases risk for marital crisis in women is linked to social problems in girls. So these include trouble getting along with others and a preference for being alone. This and Feldman's work on oxytocin, um, oxytocin's importance for the mother-child bond suggests that the hormone is more involved in the communication component of love between couples than the romantic component of love. So there's quite a bit more in that article. I'm going to skip that. But, uh, you know, it says, although research has shown that good communication predicts relationship success, successful communication and couples therapy won't always ensure that partners stay together. The goal is to help two people understand each other's point of view and come to a mutual decision. Um, if people are not connected at all, then oxytocin is not going to force that connection, um, is what the survey said. And I love that that was the conclusion. As a marriage and family therapist, that part that is pretty um, important there is these are people that are coming at this completely from a research basis. And how they say that research has shown good communication predicts relationship success, but even successful communication and couples therapy won't always ensure that partners stay together. Um, But with the goal is to help people understand each other's point of view. And I think that that's uh, at the core of the emotionally focused therapy that I love. Um, That's really what it's about. It's about seek first to understand, you know, tell me more about that kind of moments. And that even if the we had, you know, these shots of oxytocin, which I found another study that uh, where people were actually administering oxytocin by um, a nasal spray so that it would get to the brain quickly. But so you can't just add oxytocin to your repertoire and then all of a sudden people are going to communicate better. You really have to take this approach to understand your partner more before trying to express um, what you are trying to say. So a lot of uh, of interesting data today on this love hormone, cuddle hormone, um, oxytocin. But uh, hopefully the takeaway that you get today is that it is important to try to find those activities that you can do together, uh, whether it's painting, a painting class, or uh, whether it is playing board games, um, but trying to create more of those shared experiences which is going to be an opportunity for your brain to secrete this uh, this magical hormone oxytocin, a.k.a. the cuddle hormone, also known as the love hormone. Um, and uh, that in doing so, that you have a better chance, hopefully, of still being able to communicate with your partner. But the key being, you still have to do the work. You still have to, to seek first to understand, um, you know. Don't try to just bully your way with your agenda into a conversation. Find out what your partner has to say, where they're coming from, why they say the things that they do. And uh, I think that's going to go a long way, whether you're whether you've got a paintbrush in your back pocket or uh, you're you're busting out a game of checkers or chess. um, It's more important to to make that intentional time to sit down with your partner and just really uh, try to create this environment where they can open up to you and uh, and you are there for them that you want to hear them. So, hey, thanks for taking time today on the virtual couch and I hope you have a great week. Again, some bonus comment, bonus content coming up, I believe, a little bit later on this week. Um, I've got uh, a bonus episode with um, the writer and uh, parenting expert, Brooke Romney. Did a great uh, interview with her that I can't wait to release to you as well. And uh, I will see you next time on the virtual couch. Flying past our heads and out the other end, the pressures of the daily grind.